Normally Mary does the announcements. She's not here today. She's home uh, dizzy. But uh, anyway, I was just thinking about that. She said, well, there's no announcements today. And I thought, how's come when I'm doing them? <laughs> There's no announcement. I, I don't know. I, was, I just thought it just crossed my mind. I thought, she doesn't trust me with announcements. <laughs> so anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so yeah, she's, um, that's one of our prayer requests. She's home. Um, felt dizzy this morning. Was, didn't want to get up out of bed. So I um, just pray for her. And also keep uh, Chris Fouts in prayer. Chris is having surgery tomorrow morning for hernia. So we want to keep him in prayer. So if the ushers will come forward. We're going to take up our offering now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day, and we thank you for the sunshine and for the coolness of the air. Lord, we just uh, thank you for always being with us. and for always taking care of us. Lord, we pray you be with Mary. We just pray you just touch her body and Lord, just help her to get over this uh, dizziness and uh, just uh, bring healing to her. Pray for Chris, Lord. We pray that you be with him tomorrow as he goes through the surgery. Lord, we just pray you guide his doctors to do everything they need to do and to get the, everything taken care of. Lord, just bring healing to his body. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us and all that you're doing for us and going to do for us. Lord, we just look to you and trust you for everything. Lord, we just uh, pray that you just uh, receive this offering now. And Lord, just bless each one that gives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know if everybody's heard the saying that says, one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. Um, I don't know. That, I don't know. It could be old. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I remember that being said, that you know, one, one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. Well, there's a scriptural reference to that idea. And it's talking about leaven. And, in, and leaven is what you put in dough to make it rise, from what I understand. Um, I'm not a baker, but leaven is what's used to make bread rise. So in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse, it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual, immor sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not mourned that he has done, who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present with as though I were present, have judged him, who has done such a deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul, is, he's writing this letter to the church, and he's saying there's a problem. He says the church is accepting sin and morality. And he says it's even worse than what the Gentiles are doing. He says it's even worse than what the unbelievers are doing. And he says the problem is that you're afraid of offending someone. You know, you're afraid to say, hey, that's not right. That's not right. And I want to say that I don't think our goal is to offend people. And that's, that should never be our goal to offend somebody. But by the same token... When we do things and stand for truth, that can be offensive to other people. And so our goal is to show love and standing for truth. You know, people, sometimes we're hesitant to say something's wrong because, well, it's going to make somebody mad. You know, it's going to make them mad. You know, it's, um, the Bible says as sin abounds, more and more people will accept, or as sin abounds, more and more people will accept sin as normal. 
I think that's something we need to be aware of, that in, in our society now, I think as sin abounds around us, more and more people are going to say, well, that's just normal. And if you do it for 20, 30 years or 40 years, well, that's, doesn't everybody do that? Isn't that what everybody does? It, it must be okay. You know, somehow we think that, well, because the majority are doing it or whatever, that somehow it's okay and we accept sin. You know, we always have the love for the sinner but hate the sin. And I think that's very important. Remember, we always love the sinner. So when, when somebody sins, we don't not love them. And when we talk to them, we don't talk down to them. Sometimes Christians, I think when we maybe talk to somebody about something that isn't right, we start to talk down to them. And we're very disrespectful. Like we need to remember, we love the sinner, but hate the sin. And why is that? Well, in Galatians, Galatians, the uh, fifth chapter, the 19th verse, It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says if we practice those things, you know, and I always say, you know, the word I think one of the key words is practice those things. They are part of who we are. You know, they're part of who we are. If we practice those things, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I believe what happens is we start to justify things. Okay, we start to justify things. And we can justify things in all kinds of ways. And sometimes poor me is a good way to justify things. Well, you don't know how I was treated. You don't, you know, poor me, poor me. Poor me doesn't justify what is sin. And when we're talking about sin, one of the things that I'm, my main message is about is the fact that we got to be careful what we count sin. Because sometimes we justify little sins. Well, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Back in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, it said a little leaven spoils the whole lump. A little bit of leaven spoils. So it's saying that a little bit spoils everything. So what do we have to be careful of? And what does that mean? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel, when they left, the, when they left Egypt, and before, right before they left, God gives some instruction to them about leaven. And here's, here's the instructions in Exodus 12, verse 31. It says, then, then God called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, if you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we're all going to be dead. In other words, they knew God's judgment was coming, and they said, you know, get out of here quick, because if you don't, we're all going to be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened. They took their bread before it was leavened, before they put leaven in it, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. So they, they took the dough before they put the leaven in. And why did they do that? Why did they do that? On down to verse 39. It says, And they baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt, and they could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. They had to do it quick. The word was, you know, don't put the leaven in your dough. Bake it and take that with you. Quick. You don't have time for it to rise. This is serious. This is serious. And, and a little bit of that is going to cause a problem. A little bit of that is going to cause a problem. Back in Exodus 12, verse 14, 
God said, so this day shall be to you a memorial. He's talking about the Passover, okay? When they left Egypt for Passover. He says, this is going to be a memorial. This day, this day when you leave is going to be a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. In other words, keep it as a feast throughout your generations. Not just once, but keep this as a feast. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from this day, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So he says, I want you to eat unleavened bread for seven days as a memorial for when I let you out of Egypt. And he says, and you shall remove the leaven from your houses. Well, I know um, to this day when Jews celebrate Passover, one of the things they do during Passover is they send the children throughout the house to hunt for leaven. Because there can't be any in the house. Because a little leaven spoils the whole lump. So what they do is they go through the house, they search cracks and crevices. They look everywhere. They look behind a cupboard, under the bed, crumbs. Nowadays, behind a refrigerator. You know, wherever they could find bread. Because they know that just a little bit of leaven spoils the whole lump. And I believe it is also a picture. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that a little leaven spoils the whole lump. You can't say, well, that doesn't matter. That's not important. What's the difference? What's the difference? What difference does it make? As long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, what difference does it make? I've heard that said too. Well, it doesn't hurt anybody. You know, it's just, it's just me. A little leaven spoils the whole lump. So what do we do? What do we learn? There's a Psalms in Psalms 139. Psalms 139, verse 23. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, David says, Search my heart. Search my house. Search my house. Look for, look for leaven. Look for anything that is against your word. Search my heart, my house. You know, it's, it's that picture of going and saying, okay, God, look for anything in me that's not right. I think that's, that's where we start. We have to be willing. You know, okay. And, and, you know, and I mean it's willing to be honest with God and say, okay, search my heart. Show me. Look at me and see if there's any wickedness. Don't say, doesn't say, search my heart and see if there's anything big. You know, look for the big stuff. It says, search my heart and look for any wickedness, any leaven in my life. Help me not to think that a little bit is okay. That a little bit's okay. How do we do that? Well, we have something called a little white lie. We have justified lying by saying if it's little and if it's white, it's okay. What, what, is, what is that? A little white lie. A little leaven? A little leaven's okay? If I, if I just do a little bit, if I lie and it doesn't hurt anybody, we do it and we say, it's okay because everybody else is doing it. And I just want to say about everybody else is doing it. Jesus one time said, the way to death, the way to destruction is broad. That's because everybody's going down that road. And it's got to be big. Narrow is a way that leads to everlasting life. 
So we have to be very careful. I think if you're on a road and there's a big crowd and a lot of people, everybody you run around with, everybody you come in contact with is going down the same direction, maybe we should think about, is this the right path? That, you know, narrows the way. Can't allow for a leaven. We can't allow for little things. Our mind cannot say, well, that's okay. I can justify that. A lot of times that's what we do. We justify what we do. You know, I always notice when people get angry, they always say, well, Jesus did. Isn't that interesting? I always find that You know, people get angry and go off and, oh, well, Jesus got angry. And <laughs> so what? You know, Jesus got angry with the sin. He got angry with what was going on in his father's house. You know, now, I think there might be a time when you can have righteous anger. <clears throat> I don't see it happening very often, just to let you know. You know, most of the time when we say, well, Jesus got angry, we're trying to justify my attitude. Instead of saying, wow, that's a little leaven. Sometimes we think, well, if everybody, if, if everybody seems to think it's okay, then it must be okay. Like I said, Jesus doesn't work on poles. He doesn't take a pole, and if he says, well, looks like 51% of the people think this is right, so I guess it's okay. No, he's got his word, and his word is true. His word is true. He doesn't go by the majority. Matter of fact, the Bible's pretty clear, the majority are wrong. I mean, it's, you know, Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life. So the majority of the people are wrong. And I think sometimes we just, we got to be careful. We can get caught up in, we can get caught up in thinking something's okay because everybody's doing it. You know, I think it just happens slowly over generation after generation after generation. Looks to me if you go down a bad path, the third generation is about the crucial point. That, you know, by the time sin is involved, and if it goes three generations, by the third generation, it's a disaster. Now, that's not 100%, but that's just an observation. That, you know, it just goes time and time and time. You know, what I thought was true, my children don't think is true. What I thought was true, my grandchildren think is normal. That's just, that's just my observation. Now, people can always come back to the Word of God. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, that's my observation. My next observation is, we're at about the third generation. Now, at the third generation, things can happen. Things can change. There's always a place for repentance. There's always a place for repentance. But that's the only answer. That's the only answer. It has to get to that. Sometimes when people look at leaven, they say, well, nobody's perfect. Ever hear people, well, no, what do you expect? Nobody's perfect. That's true. Jesus was. And you know what I've come to the conclusion? You know, the Bible says, that we should be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect? You know, if, if God didn't expect us to be perfect, we would lower the standard even worse. Because if God said, well, just get it close. Just get it close. Well, now we can just back up and get a little further. I can just, I can just, but he, you know, he had to say, be ye therefore perfect. You know, our desire should be perfect as he is perfect. I'm not saying we're perfect. I said, be therefore perfect. That's what I'm striving for. That's what I want to do. Because otherwise, you're going to justify leaven. You're going to justify sin. That's just how it's going to work. You know, and thank goodness for God's grace and mercy. He knows, he knows we're not perfect. If we were perfect, he wouldn't have had to send his son. So he knows that. But he says, be therefore perfect. So, you know, so when I stand before him, I go, well, God, 
Nobody was perfect. I, everybody else was doing it. Well, I didn't think it would hurt anything. You know, Jesus said some very strong statements in one of his first sermons. I think it probably his first, but I'm not sure. But it was one of his first. Jesus said some things about leaven. He said, uh, you know what? If you're angry with someone, you're going to be in danger of judgment. If you're angry with somebody, you know, well, that's just a little bit of leaven. He says, if you won't forgive somebody else, my father won't forgive you. You know, and we go, whoa, wait a minute. Well, that's, that's a little strong. He said, if we say you fool, we're in danger of hell's fire. You know, if we, we say, well, you know, oh, you're so stupid. You know, we're in danger of hellfire. Because the, the religious people said, oh, hey, we don't kill, we don't, we don't murder, we don't do nothing like that. And Jesus says, well, how about if you're angry? It's the same thing. That little bit of leaven is just as bad as a bigger thing. If we say I've never committed adultery, but lust after someone, we've already committed adultery. Wow. You know, if we just lust after someone, we've, we've already done it. That's, a little, that's just a little bit of leaven. A little bit of leaven is what your eyes see and desire. And it's what we think in our heart. You know, a lot of times, those thoughts we have, those, those little things. You know, I think the culmination of thoughts that are evil and what we see and have in our heart, it, the culmination is big sin. You know, I think, I think we need to nip it in the bud when it's a little bit of leaven. That we say, whoa, you know, even to have that thought about somebody is wrong. You know, that we realize that, you know, we just can't, we can't tolerate it. Now, some might say, well, it's nitpicky. Well, you might think it's nitpicky, but, you know, the Bible says a little bit of leaven spoils the dough. A little bit of leaven causes bigger problems. If we don't stop it early on, then we can have big problems. Bigger problems. I think God judges all things the same. I think God judges a little leaven the same as a big leaven. In other words, I don't think God says, okay, you get a five on that because that was too much. Well, that was a bad one. Now you're going to get a ten. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think that's how it works. I think sin is sin. And I think a lot of times we just need to have that understanding. Have that understanding. So what do we, what do, we do? What do we do? In 1 John, the first chapter, the 8th verse, I share this a lot of times at communion. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, if we say we have no sin. And so we go, okay, I haven't murdered anybody this week. I didn't rob a bank. I wasn't, you know, I'm okay. Well, you know, we probably ought to look for things that are a little bit of leaven. We ought to look for things that are not that big. We all look for things in our heart and what we do and, and how we think and what we say. Because a little bit of leaven spoils the whole lump. So we first have to say, okay, I have sinned. I have sinned. Confess our sins. The Bible says examine ourself. We examine ourself. We, we look at what we're doing. We look at what, are, what we're thinking. We come to grips with where we're at. We're honest before God. Search my heart. 
You know, I don't know if, if sometimes we think God's playing a game with us and the game is hide and seek. That I follow him, but if I can keep my sin from him seeing it and get away with it, he won't notice. You know, the Bible's pretty clear that he sees everything. So he sees little leaven, he sees big leaven. He sees everything. So we say, okay, God, search my heart. You know, search my heart. And then we find out, maybe, that, wow, I've sinned. There's things in my life that aren't the way they ought to be. And at that point, we make a decision. We make a decision to feel bad and just say, oh, woe is me. I'm doomed. Or we can accept what God has done for us. Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love. When we confess, if we say, oh, that's okay, if we start to justify our sin, there's no confession. There's no, you're not confessing anything if you justify it. Well, you know, everybody's doing it. Well, I can't help it. That's the way God made me. I've heard that excuse. That's just the way God made me. Well, the Bible says he wants to change you. You may be made that way. God didn't make you sin, but we were born in sin. And God comes to redeem us from the curse of the law, to redeem us from that. He demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we confess our sins and we receive what he has done. I receive it. Sometimes we maybe do that better with little sins than big sins. Sometimes I notice when people have big sins, it's harder to believe that God would forgive them. God will forgive little ones the same as big ones and big ones the same as little ones. He'll demonstrate a love. He forgives us. He sent his son to die for our forgiveness, for our sins. That's what we rejoice in. And we never take advantage of God's grace. You know, sometimes Christians, if we're not careful, we can take advantage of God's grace thinking, well, it's God's job to forgive, so what's the big deal? I sin, he forgives. I sin, he forgives. I believe there's no repentance if I sin, he forgives as a part of my lifestyle. There's no, there's no repentance. I'm playing some kind of game with him. I'm taking advantage of his grace. You know, I think when we understand his love and his grace and his mercy for us, when we really understand that, that then we walk in what he has done for us. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We overcome by what he did. Not what you do. You can't overcome on your own. You overcome by him and what he has done for us. And then that's what we say. That's my confession. That I overcome because of him. Overcome because of him. Not because of me. Not because of my faith. Because I have such great faith. You know, the Bible talks about, but, you know, I talked about faith. But I don't overcome by my ability to have faith. I overcome by trusting what he did. I do that by faith, if that makes any sense. I do it by faith. But it's not my faith that gets the job done. My faith is in the one who got the job done. My faith is in him. And I trust him. So, I'm, so you know, I'm not afraid. I shouldn't be afraid to say, okay, Lord, search my heart. Show me. Why, why would we want to even do that? Oh, I, you know, why would you want to do that? 
Well, the Bible says that we can become more like him. Well, why should we become more like him? Well, so I can get a star by my name. You know, there must be a something somewhere that gives me a little credit. So if I become more like Jesus, I get a star? No. We become more like him so we can do his will. It's when Christians become more like him that we're going to make a difference in the world around us. That's when we're going to make a difference. We're the salt of the earth. We're the salt of the earth. We have to become more like him. It's an ongoing, never-ending process till the day you die. So, you know, don't think, well, I got that done. Well, pastor preached about that. And I didn't see too many little sins, so I'm good to go. Well, just let him search your heart and see what he says. You know, and then obey. Receive his forgiveness. You know, so many times people have trouble feeling like God would forget them, forgive them. They have trouble believing God loves them. You know, that has to be foundational. That God loves me. And he loved me while I was still a sinner. He loves me. And because he loves me, I want to be more like him. I want to be like him. I want to be able to reach others, do for others, share with others, love others. I want to be the salt. I want to, I want to make a difference. You know, and I just say, you know, so many times we lament, oh, you know, things are so bad, things are so bad. Well, you know, if things are so bad, I want to tell you something. You're the only one that's going to make a difference. We're the salt of the earth. Who do you think is going to change things? We're the salt of the earth. We're it. You know, we're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time in the next nine months trying to change things. You know, that's not the answer. Now, you know, miraculously, something could happen that God might intervene. I don't know. You know, you can always pray for a miracle that God intervenes and somehow there's an answer there. But, you know, I think he says to the church, you're the salt of the earth. You're the answer. You're the answer. Quit looking other places for the answer. You know, quit looking for somebody to come and fix everything. You know, if you think about it, everybody's going to come and fix everything. That's what they tell me every time there's an election. You know, I'm getting all kinds of papers in the mail that say, hey, here I am. I'm going to fix everything. I care for your safety. I care for this. I care for that. I'm going to take care of you. I think some of them are serious about what they want to do, but I don't think they're the answer. I just don't think they're the answer. I think we're the salt of the earth. We're the ones that's going to change things because the answer dwells in us. The answer dwells in us. And Jesus says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So I think we just need to be more like him. Search our hearts, Lord. Show us if there's anything, anything that we need to do or change to be more like you. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would search our hearts. Lord, just, just remind us that you search our hearts because you love us. Lord, it's not like we're trying to hide from you and, and afraid you're going to find something out. Lord, just help us to search our hearts and help us to be more like you. Lord, fill us with your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to make a difference wherever we're at. Lord, wherever we're at, wherever people we're around, whatever, whoever we might touch, help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to make a difference. Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you for your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.